A closer look at the contemporary drama of immigrants reveals another layer which has remained almost invisible, undisclosed, unseen, unknown. The existential situation of those retained in their own lands, unable to leave, rejected at the border of their dreamland, to be then sent back to a senseless life, is rarely visible. Some are able to cross the borders, only to be kept indefinitely at detention centers. My name is Eddie Nsareko. I am a Ugandan. I come from Uganda. I was born in about 52 kilometers in the north of Kampala, which is the capital of Uganda. So I am 48 years of age. And um, yeah, I'm here to tell the story. There is this person, a friend of mine who I very well know, is a guy who went to school, he finished university, but he couldn't get a job. So all he had to do is to sell some foodstuffs in the market. Along the way, he got some kids, he couldn't take care of them. His wife left him, so he decided to take the kids to his mom in the village so he can go abroad and try to look for greener pastures. Now this guy is called John. What John did, so I, he was a desperate guy. He, he did it so desperately, but he couldn't make it. What he did, he took his kids to his mom in the village, about 70 kilometers out of town. He sold everything he had, including his TV, his sofa, his everything in his house. He went and borrowed the money from his friends, everyone who he knew that he could help him. He contributed the money, he contributed money and gave the money to the dealer because he wanted to leave and go in England. He wanted to go to London because Uganda is an English-speaking country. Most people, they go to London or America. Not so many people come to Brazil like me. I'm just a, a, a lucky guy. Now, John, what John did, he got the money, he gave it to his friend. What the guy did, he, he used Photoshop, he fabricated the document because normally they ask for um, an invitation from the country where you're going. They want a bank statement which has so many, so much money. This guy working in the market, he didn't even have a bank account. You know, they want a letter if you're using someone to sponsor you to give you the bank statement to go. So what? So many documents. So the dealer fabricated the documents and they gave the documents to John to present to the British, uh, to the British um, Embassy or High Commission to get a visa to go to England, to London, and work just like his friend who he knew, who were working and sending the money home. They have good houses, they have good life, they have good cars. So he gave the money, the guy fabricated the document, they gave the documents to John. Now here is John, dressed in a very nice suit, which he had, left with him. He went to the visa uh, consulate to get the visa. But when they looked at the documents, they were all fabricated. Now, what they, used, what they did during that time was to call the police, because it is a criminal offense to have fabricated documents, according to the law of Uganda. 
the police arrested John and they took him to police cells where he stayed for three days. When they took him, because he didn't want to go to court, some of his friends who knew him, that John was a good man, they came running to rescue him from police. They corrupted the police, they gave him a lot of money. John was released. John, going back to the village, before he went to the village, he started looking for the dealer. Could he see the dealer? The dealer was nowhere to see. The phones are off. You know, what John did was, it was so bad because he committed suicide. The striking dramatic experience of those who aim to leave their countries but have not yet become immigrants are remarkably absent in traditional media narratives or even in publicly accessible networks. Their undisclosed plight, seeking a different life, could shed light on a hidden side of immigration. However, the retained, rejected, deported population must gain media coverage, visibility and identity. They need a public voice. Their own voices must be broadcasted, heard, their stories widely known. My name is Nalkenge Jean. I'm from Uganda. I was born in the city Kampala. Then a friend of mine wanted to go to Arab Emirates but she could not go through because she was sick. She had fever. Can you imagine fever? And then they told her she could not get to, uh, is it Saudi Arabia, to work as a maid. Then some others are conned. Like I have a friend of mine, I, I will not speak out his name. He wanted to come to Brazil, specifically Brazil. And then what happened, he got someone who is into Ugandan games, like a minister in games. So this guy told him, I can make you go as a cyclist, so that you, you say you're going to participate in the games that are going to happen in Brazil, cycling. Then he was like, okay. He sold his property from the house. His mother sold the piece of land. Then they gave this guy, we call him coach, they gave him some money. It, it was like, it, it, I don't, in, in Brazilian, it is like 3,000 years. Then when time came, he was, they were calling him, hello, the visa, what happened? We're not receiving the visa. I'm still working on it, working on it. For six months, they, they had nowhere to, to stay. Remember, the mother was now living with the sisters. She was hiding in a friend's place because he had also sold everything. And like that, up to now, he's still waiting, but I don't think there is any hope. He won't come. Then, sometimes some get through. They come to the green pastures, but then they are deported back. I have a friend, she, she, was, she got a U.S. visa. In Uganda, if you're give, granted a U.S. visa, you're given two years. But you have to be in the U.S. not more than six months. Implying every after six months, you have to go back home. So she got the first visa for two years. She was in U.S. for four times. She could go, work, then go back to Uganda, settle, build something, take care of her family. But... You know, in U.S., you, you don't tell them I'm going to work and they give you a visa. She had told them that she, she had gone to for a conference. But now, one time when she was coming from the U.S., coming back to Uganda, they checked her luggage. And her luggage had so many receipts of which she, she, was, she was being paid while working in the U.S. So they told her, you who said you're going for a conference, what are these receipts doing in what? Your bag. So they told her, don't come back to U.S. And she, 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 she's at home. She can't go to the U.S. And she's scared of requesting for a visa because they, you know, embassies share information. So she's at home stuck. She's trying to put things together and the little money she had earned.
They had decided to leave their homes, facing the challenges of living in another country, culture, language, landscape. They have committed themselves to an almost impossible endeavor to flee from poverty, from life-threatening socio-political instability, and even from violence to their own physical and psychological integrity. But they have not succeeded. They have been retained in their own lands, rejected at the dividing borders, or they are forced to wait while their fate is decided. My name is Jedeon Anzu. Uh, most people call me Jude. Uh, I'm coming from the Democratic Republic of Congo, GRC. Uh, actually, I just want to talk about a specific story here because, you know, most people in the GRC, most of the people, due to the um, current regime, which took the power since 1997, there was a war in the eastern part of the Congo. So we have lost almost 6 million person, people by all. So most of the guys now, as now the government was now imposing us now to go in the military, once you finish your high school, you must go by force in the mil military. So most, guy, most of the people now start leaving the country. And for us now to get like European visa, it was very difficult. So the most, most closest country to Congo in Africa was South Africa, where it's at least more developed than in Congo. So we end up going there, and they also, like particularly in South Africa, the conditions are not good because um, they are not giving pe people paper, like in terms of paper. I know people who have been there for 20 years, but they're still Islam seeker. They still have a refugee paper. So they don't change even the paper and whatever. So actually, I've stayed with most of my friends who want now to leave the country, South Africa, and go abroad in Europe. So, in order for you to leave from South Africa and go to Europe, you must still, be, before you need to have a work permit, or a study visa, work permit, or permanent resident. So, which is impossible now to get, because if you want to get this permit, they will ask you to go and apply in your home country to the South African Embassy. You need to go there and apply. So, there was these guys who came up with the, a cooperation so actually, they will go and look for a South African guys, a homeless guys, South African, someone who is not functioning properly. They will give him money. And they will go and uh, took the idea of that person, like RG, and go and apply for a passport, a normal passport. And once that passport now is in the step whereby the person must now go for, to get the capture, you know, you know when you apply for the passport, you must go now to get captured for the photo and whatever. So they will now go to home affairs like Police Federal and give money to the people who are capturing. Instead of capturing the proper person who apply for the passport, they will, apply, they will capture now someone else. So the passport will come out, a good passport, but with someone identity, but someone else first day. So, in the airport now, to board on the plane, because like South Africa is going to Ireland with that visa, to board in the airport, it's a very difficult. It's very, very difficult. And to get to that process, to finalize that process, people are spending like 1,500 US dollars. Imagine now, after spending 1,500 US dollars, like my friend Jano did spend 1,500 US dollars, and also he bought a ticket which was like 1,200 US dollars, and he go to the airport, they discover that he was not the true owner of that passport. And then they capture him. In South Africa, it's not like here. In South Africa, they will send you to jail. So, and also in jail in South Africa, there's also, it is not safe because they're like human violation. So, you know, they're gonna you know, rip you there. But he was not ripped. It was very, very, very bad. And when he came out, uh, he became like a, he had a depression. So he was depressed. And even up to date, his living condition is not okay at all. They inhabit the shadow world of the media, unknown, unheard of, unseen. 
they become immobile, hidden, voiceless.